good afternoon. My name is Brent Morgan. I am um, a director of Rogers Ready. Um, and uh, there we go. We'll do that a little bit better. Um, I am a director of Rogers Ready. Let's let's change that so you can actually see me from from a um, similar distance. Um, we who is Rogers Ready? Well, Rogers Ready is an international firm. Um, you've, you've known us for some time. Um, if you haven't heard from us previously, um, we are uh, probably the largest uh, um, insolvency firm in respect to um, Australian coverage. We have uh, coverage in um, Queensland, New South Wales, um, Northern Territory and Tasmania. So we're very lucky to have reach in those parts of the world, including uh, Western Australia. Um, we are also part of the BTG Global Advisory. Um, and with that, um, we are um, members of a worldwide group that specialises in insolvency. 100 directors and 100 staff in Rogers Reedy, um, and uh, we're very, very proud of that. We have 250 people attending today. Um, they've seen me run around trying to uh, get our technology working, apologise, but uh, we're, we're eventually there. Now, just to talk about Rogers Reedy's experience in uh, dealing with uh, Chinese businesses, um, we've seen uh, definitely um, uh, an involvement in um, distressed businesses that have uh, Chinese ownership. Um, we're involved currently at the moment um, on a dry milk powder um, plant in Victoria, um, and we're doing the turnaround of that currently. Last year, uh, a Chinese-owned logistics company, um, we were very successful in doing a turnaround, which ultimately saw, um, you know, 100 cents in the dollar um, and a substantial return to, to the owners in um, China will come from that. So we're seeing some distress in that space. We're seeing some involvement in that space. And that's why we thought it would be a good topic to talk today about. Um, so, China-Australian relations. Uh, it's, it's, it's evolving. And I think some people who for a long time had no involvement, um, it's now um, mainstream media. So it's definitely um, people are becoming aware of it. The China um, foreign trade for Australia is worth uh, over $200 billion, and um, it has been like that to, to Australia for some time. But after a series of uh, defence, trade and, and foreign um, policy issues, um, they've led to what was seen to be the lowest point in relations between the two entities, uh, two uh, countries for decades. Um, it took a nasty turn in uh, um, 2020, um, and that's when a Chinese government official doctored a image of an Australian soldier with a knife to the throat of, uh, of, of a young Afghan um, child. That, uh, and that caused a huge uproar between the relationship between the, uh, the two countries. Um, but how do we get there? Well, I mean, historically, we've seen that uh, the relationships between the two, um, the China's foreign policy and rapid modernisation has uh, concerned a lot of the Australian politicians for some time. Um, the turning point in 2017 occurred when um, the Australian uh, government banned foreign um, political donations uh, with officials warning that there was uh, Chinese attempts to influence um, government policy and political processes in China. So that caused that ruckus. Uh, in 2018, the following year, what we saw was um, the first, Australia was the first country to ban um, the Chinese tech giant Huawei um, from the 5G network, which um, caused a lot of issues. Uh, it also then reportedly went on to ban 10 Chinese investment uh, deals in infrastructure and uh, agriculture um, uh, around. So that uh, caused issues. Then 2020, um, that was the year that we try to forget, um, but ultimately it, it happened. Um, and uh, the coronavirus occurred. And then we had uh, 
the Australian leading the Australian government leading the charge for an independent inquiry into uh, what caused um, the coronavirus. Um, and Australia also followed that on with criticism with um, China, Beijing's uh, influence in Hong Kong, Taiwan, and the China Sea. So we're prodding the beast, there's no doubt about it. And then Australia goes on and forms a relationship which is called Quad, um, which you'll see um, has, has been uh, in the news recently as well. That's an alliance. Uh, it's a US-led alliance between um, the United States, India, Japan, and Australia. Uh, the Chinese government have come out and said that they see that as a US-led attempt to create an Asian version of NATO. So they have, uh, have not been happy with that. What, what has been China's response? Uh, well, China's response has been very swift um, and we've felt the impact. Um, in May last year, China curbed Australian imports of, uh, of beef, um, levied tariffs totaling um, 90 per cent against Australian barley, uh, and then in November imposed tariffs of 200 per cent um, for Australian wine. And then um, quite visibly what uh, people would have seen in the media, which was uh, the banning of Australian coal exports with numerous ships um, sitting uh, in waiting to be delivered into China. And that was $14 billion worth of uh, coal. Now, China represents 35% of our um, total trade. Um, and this fear is, is that this conflict between the two countries, uh, uh, which represents 6% of the Australian GDP, um, was going to majorly impact um, with a continued um, trade war. On the reverse, Australia only represents 4% of uh, China's trade. So we're a small player. But with all that, it, it's appropriate that we have some experts to have a chat to us um, about everything. And that's what we've got here today. We've got um, panel experts who are um, specialists in China relations. Um, with, and we have a brand consultant, which I'll, I'll talk to soon. We have an accountant and we have a lawyer and they're all specialists in the China space. So let's get straight to it. Enough of me, let's talk to the experts. Um, Chin Hang, good afternoon, Chin, how are you? Good, good, Brent, how are you? You thought I was gone? You, you, oh, no, you I thought... didn't, I knew you were coming back. <laughs> oh, what's he done? He doesn't know how to operate a computer. Um, just to give some background to Chin, uh, Chin is a former migrant banker with Westpac, uh, she now runs a very successful brand consultancy firm called Foreign Co, um, which helps migrant businesses um, learn how to integrate with the Australian market um, and also helps Australian brands unlock potentials in the Chinese market. Um, she has a deep understanding experience in cross-border and cross-cultural uh, businesses um, and provide insights in the Australian-China relationships and we'll also provide some tips on how to navigate the maze. So it's it's great to have you here. It just quickly, Chin, is the Australian brand tarnished forever in China? Uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that. Um, no, no. I think Australian brands are still perceived, you know, quite as premium uh, in the Chinese market. Um, but there are certainly hurdles that we need to come through, uh, come over. So I'll talk about that. Um, you know, later on in detail. Fantastic. Okay. Thank you, Chin. Blessed to have um, Richard Sen. Richard Sen is a partner at Nexia. Nexia is the, an international um, accounting and consult consultancy firm. Uh, Richard heads up the um, team that advises inbound and outbound um, uh, investment in China. He's an expert in this field. Um, so his expertise will help us understand the money flow in and out of China um, and, uh, and how we can uh, ultimately un unlock the growth and basically deal with issues today. Richard, Hello, good afternoon. How are you? Good afternoon. How are you? Good. And Richard's promised me, he said to me last week that he knew that I hadn't been to Shanghai, promised that he was going to uh, show me Shanghai one day when we're allowed out again. Once the doors open. Once the doors are open, we'll be there. So uh, looking forward to that again. Um, finally, um, Catherine Tan.
Catherine. Um, good afternoon, Catherine. How are you? Good, Brent. How are you? Great. Um, Catherine is a litigation lawyer with McPherson & Kelly, very well-respected law firm uh, in Australia. Uh, Catherine has deep links with the Chinese community. Um, she's bilingual and able to offer advice in Mandarin. Fantastic. I mean, I don't, I don't even do English well. Um, so for you to do two, you're doing fantastic. Um, she has a lot of experience um, in the cross-jurisdictional um, litigation across Australia and China. Um, that is amazing. Um, and uh, Catherine will talk about the legal and contractual issues that have risen since uh, in between the businesses, um, between the two countries of late. So um, looking forward to that. Um, what would be appropriate, Catherine, now is for me to say good afternoon in Mandarin, but I, I, I've got no idea. What, Do you want to try? What, yeah, can you try? Wow. You can try. You, you can say um, Xiao Wow. Oh. I would, I'd, I'd embarrass myself, and I did that earlier <laughs> today trying to log into the computer, so, so I won't. Um, <laughs> thanks for trying, though, Catherine. Let's start. We're, we're, we're breaking up today's um, presentation into sort of three sort of parts, um, and the first part is about relationships between the two countries, um, the brand, the Australian brand, and how it's perceived, and and, uh, and also the trust element, which is a huge part. Uh, between the two entities. So we're going to start on that. And I thought um, with that, we would lead with uh, Chin. Um, I mean, Chin, how, how do you see the current um, Australian-China relationship um, uh, from all perspectives, but both China and Australia? Um, how do you see it? Yeah, um, it's, a, it's a great question. It's, it's a big question as well. Um, but I just wanted to share something that um, you probably wouldn't normally see in media, I guess. Um, I guess when we talk about Australia-China relation, we can't really look at it as a standalone bilateral relations without the overarching context that, um, you know, of the US-China relations, really. Because, you know, all the, I guess, you know, the restrictions and, and what have happened over the last few years that, we, that we've witnessed um, is a manifestation of that bigger context because you know, Australia is strategically aligned with the US, uh, whereas it's also geographically situated in the Asia Pacific region. So that's the big picture we cannot, um, I guess, overlook. But, and then also let's have a look at the numbers. So according to DFAT's total foreign investment number as of end of 2019, um, the US has been and is the number one investor in Australia, um, outnumbering the UK uh, in the second place by almost half um, in percentage at $983 billion. And Hong Kong sitting at the fifth at about $140 billion. Mainland China is at the ninth um, at around $78.2 billion. And these are all public numbers that anyone can download from the DFATS website. Um, also China is however, the number one trading partner with Australia, um, almost, you know, makes up, you know, you said 35%, I got 40%, you know, we get the gist of it, um, of the total trade um, volume. Um, and during, I guess, you know, the uh, sort of, you know, when the relationship started to get a bit thorny, um, starting from 2017, the numbers are actually still increasing, you know, over the last three years. And out of that total numbers, 60% um, of the export um, is composed of iron ore and coal, even though coal was banned last year. But we still saw quite a surge in iron ore last year um, exported to China. And some may even say that the numbers almost compensated for the loss due to the restrictions. I think that's what um, Bill Evans, the chief economist from the Westpac Group, mentioned that. So that's, you know, what it is. Um, but at the same time, obviously, consumer products such as barley, wine, beef, um, now tuna, um, you know, has been banned and we don't know where that's headed. We don't know whether, you know, other products will be on the next list, um, but it probably wouldn't come as a surprise if the total number of export is still increasing, is still increasing. But that's what you wouldn't probably see in the media. Yeah. Uh, it looks like, you know, the tariffs being slapped on all these industries and, you know, the 
the business owners are suffering from that. That's for sure. That's, that's not, that's, you know, that's, that's not negligible. Um, but I think um, we've got to take into the consideration of a, of a bigger picture. Um, but on the, on another, um, I guess, topic is the service industries, whereas education and tourism are the two biggest service industries exported to, you know, China being the biggest um, export de destination. So we probably will see how that's panning out, um, you know, when the restrictions being lifted. So hopefully that will see numbers coming back. So I guess if we look at those points that, you know, US probably um, is and will be the largest investor in Australia, um, and so will China be the biggest trading partner, um, you know, as the bigger picture. Of course, we're, we're, we're experiencing hiccups and, and um, you know, tremors as, as we go. But I think it largely depends on how the US-China relationship will unfold. So that's kind of my personal opinion on that. Yeah. But I also, I'd also like to remind that, you know, China's led the RCEP um, in the region uh, where Australia and, and is, is a part of. And also there is still the free trade agreement that Australia is, in, is, is, is enjoying with China. Which, uh, which is important for iron ore, which is free flowing at the moment. Absolutely. Um, would, would be in trouble without it. Um, there's, there's no doubt about it. Uh, and we can talk about, we'll talk about the stats. It's interesting. It's, um, we'll talk about the stats later on about uh, what, what's happening. It's, um, but, but it's all driven by iron, iron ore. Um, the business relationship, Richard, thank you. Thank you, Chin. Um, the, Richard, the business relationships between, um, you know, the two countries, I mean, is it as bad as what, what we're seeing in the media? Is it, is it, what, what are you seeing? I mean, you've got firsthand experience. Okay, uh, I, I think the question is really how media describe China, in particular in Australia, right? It, it describes China as, as a dragon, uh, as a monster, or as a panda. And the, and the recollection will be quite different, right? So if the, if the media on both sides deliberately discredit each other, so the business relationship will not be good. So entrepreneurs will worry about safety of their investments. That's the situation for the moment, right? Of course, I mean, compared to the state-owned enterprises that pull out a lot of um, like investments and set the restrictions on the trade, private capital still consider Australia is a very good place for investments, for, for its claim, the safety and, and, uh, and the resources. So um, on the other side, you know, wholesale and distribution is still very strong, in particular under the COVID situation um, for the industry that is in, not impacted by the, the, the COVID-19. So I've got a number of clients actually, their sales goes to the roof, you know, um, and, uh, and quite a number of the goods are actually imported from China. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. So not, not as worse as media describes. Describes. Excellent. Said, yeah. and, and Catherine, uh, thanks, Richard. And Catherine, what are, what are the impacts you're seeing, um, I mean, locally uh, with your clients? I mean, have Chinese investors just lost confidence in Australia um, and the Australian market? I mean, Richard says no, but what, what are you seeing? I mean, you're dealing with a lot of transactions. I guess I'm seeing the other side of it. Um, the, some of our clients, they perhaps need to raise funds, um, such as like big, uh, medium big fintech companies that would usually, you know, be backed by Chinese investors. They're finding that they are um, having to set up offices, say in China, to do that. Otherwise, um, there are many Chinese investors uh, that are actually losing confidence in the Australian market because of the political tension and also uncertainty about the future. So there, there would be investors and including uh, some of the people that I know um, from Chinese background working in Melbourne, they have actually chosen to relocate back to China during the COVID times because 
before maybe the perception would be you know it's a it's a good life in Australia we we all want to come here want to migrate here but I guess uh, over the past few years you can see China really rising up and many Chinese people here actually see you know a lot of opportunity to go back to China and work in China so it is very different from say 20 years ago um, and I guess the property developments in Australia, there are a lot of them are backed by Chinese investors as well, which can be a bit concerning. And from the consumer end, uh, we also, uh, a lot of the off the plan apartments in a city, for example, um, they might be purchased by Chinese people who are looking to send their children here. So in light of the political tension and the uncertainty, we're seeing that has slowed down as well. People are not in a hurry to buy Australian properties. Yeah, well, um, that's interesting. And, and, and it flows on to something I want to know from Richard is about um, how, you know, particularly with this unease and, and, uh, and trust being an important part of the relationship, um, uh, you know, for Chinese uh, investors. I mean, how do, you, how, do, how do the Chinese investors find um, a trustworthy Australian advisor and vice versa as well? Is, is there... Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, a lot of people are talking about, you know, Western or Eastern relationship. You know, we we'll use a, a word of guanxi. And this guanxi, this word is flooded when talking about business with Chinese, right? But my interpretation is actually a bit different, especially for the younger generation of Chinese. So I would say trust is probably the more important, but behind trust, is the understanding. So understand the culture, understand the objective, and understand the subtext. For Chinese to know many, or remember a lot of names in, in Western advice, of Western advisors is extremely hard. Just like the same as the Australian people to remember a lot of Chinese names, right? Maybe none of them, right? I'll never forget your Richard. I remember your name. <laughs> so, so, so for you know, so, 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 if you want to actually work um, for a Chinese company or investors, and I'll say create a personal name into the Chinese community is very important. That's how they're looking for their trust advisors, and know a few rep reputable Chinese advisors, not just a marketing person, will help you to expand their work. Right. So, and also know China. You go to China, visit China, and have the most intuitive feeling. Because traditionally, people always, or especially from Western people, always use Hong Kong as a gateway, but not yes, anymore, not as that important. So, people would, I would suggest that you work with people, especially um, the advisors in large cities like Beijing, Shanghai, or Guangzhou, or Shenzhen. And they are all a lot of uh, um, English, English, English speaking advisors there, so you can use. Um, from Australian perspective, you need to be specialized in your area, uh, whatever is commercial law, tax, accounting, MA, IPO. I know. And very, the last thing is very important is uh, be directed and not too many choices. Right? I use a sample, same as you go to Chinese restaurants. And you order three your three favorite dishes. What will be, right? So, so a lot of times I see, um, uh, especially lawyers, because I can't like lawyers. Um, you know, sitting in the meeting room, you know, you have a partner which is Western, uh, the Aussie partner. You have a translator, and you have a junior. That meeting costs one thousand five hundred dollars an hour, and through the translation, half of the time lost it. Mm -hmm. So. You, you probably need to change a bit of way, you know, to um, to have your um, you know senior associate or a, a, a Chinese partner understand the situation and work together and give a better uh, result. And then your name will be spread over the Chinese yep. community in yep. here or overseas. Yep. Great advice. Great, great advice. Um, thank you, Richard. Um, I'm, I'm interested, rolling back to uh, something I touched on with uh, Chen just before, is the perception, um, and I suppose around Australia at the moment, considering where things are at, but I mean, it, how is the brand, how is the Australian brand 
perceived at the moment? And how is Australia perceived by, you know, the people on the streets in China um, and the Australian brand, you know, being the things that have been, you know, the milk and milk products and, and wine and barley and all those sorts of uh, things. Um, how is it perceived, Jen? Um, I, I, obviously, I can't really say on behalf of um, the Chinese can't. market and I haven't really no. been You're not speaking back. on behalf well, of all the billions? You know, last year, I haven't been back. But um, in general, I think Australian brands are perceived still quite, you know, as premium um, in Australia as a country, um, you know, is a developed country and it enjoys like clean air, like what Richard said. I know it's got great natural resources. So the brands are perceived as, as quite premium um, in the Chinese market. Um, but because it's got the premium perception, um, I guess, you know, it's penetration into the lowest tiered cities in, in China this is, is slightly limited. Um, and at the same time, I guess I wanted to remind brand owners is that um, when your brands are in the Chinese market competing, you're not just competing with your fellow competitors, you know, from back home. You're also competing with brands from around the world. Um, and especially now, um, you know, like after, I guess, you know, post COVID, um, we see a rise in national brands. So, you know, now this is another competitor, um, I guess, in the role that the brand owners need to be really um, pay attention to um, because um, I think I read in a report conducted by CNB and, um, CNBC with Alibaba um, saying that reporting that, you know, for people born after 1995, which is referred to as the Z generation, they're actually pr pretty brand agnostic um, to say the least. You know, some even say that they favor national brands over foreign brands. So that's something the brand owners need to, I guess, be alert um, and be cautious about. And also is that when brands prepare to, I guess, you know, re-enter China maybe after, after this situation, um, they really need to work on, they just need to do their market research quite well. They need to do their homework well, and they need, need to prepare for a pretty big budget for marketing. And yeah. that's what I would say yep. and 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 i guess because it's a you know it's also premium brands and it's premium products there are highly i guess they're because they're not necessities so they're highly substitutable and that's why we see you know like when the tariffs hit it doesn't really affect the chinese consumers but it actually you know affects more the business owners so that's another thing that the brand owners need to be aware of excellent um thanks chin um well, move, moving away to that um, that side of our brand and and, uh, and perception between the two, I'm very interested to see about trade and money and and, and how that how the flow through um, is, is affecting financially. Um, as I said before, uh, you, you know the two way trade between the two in, um, two countries. Um, in 2019, was uh, you know in excess of 250 billion, um, which was uh, up from about up 17 percent from the year before, um, and then 2020 hit. But uh, you know, it's no doubt about it that China is uh, Australia's biggest trade partner, so it's important. But let's see how it, how the flow through of, um, of uh, money, um, Richard. Very interested to know about the slowing of trade. Um, and what it means to Australian businesses and what you're seeing. And, and, and do you think it's permanent? Yeah. Well, I think first, it, my, my view is it's not permanent. And I think the other Australians can have a of sign of relief. So, but however, say that, so the short pain there, right? So the slowing of the trade will hurt a lot of Australian business, reliance export to China. So whether it's resources, education, agriculture, tourism, at the same time, we'll have a have a chain reactions of the upstream and downstream uh, industries, right? So why it is not permanent? Because the economics, the foundation of China and Australia are complementary. Right? So in terms of the money side, I'll say you, you look about it. I mean, you know, China is really plays a very important role in the Asia Pacific region. You know, we, we did the statistics on the migration. So 
in, in the last three years. So the Department of Immigration issued over about 2,000, to around 2,400 SIV visas. And surprisingly, over 90% is from China. So that's a huge amount of money. I, I, but I think after COVID, I, I will see a, a return of the, uh, the SIV application. Yes, yeah. well as the investments. Yeah. And, and th uh, thanks, Richard. Catherine, what, how are you seeing the issues of flow of money in and out of China and, and, um, and you know, the transactions that you're dealing with? Yeah, I, I agree with Richard. I don't think all of this is permanent, but definitely we've had uh, feedback from client. I've had feedback from friends that it's getting really difficult to transfer money out of China, not specifically to Australia, but just out of China in general. So that will have an impact on, let's say, significant investment visa where you need to transfer a lot of money um, and, and all kinds of issues might arise from that. There are uh, some Australian companies that specifically target China as a market. Let's say they might manufacture a certain product, for example, a hair product. They, they might be sold here, but really their main market is in China, for example. So that is going to, the, the difficulties in transferring money out of China is going to have a huge impact on, um, on, and on being able to uh, carry on with this, this contract, for example. So another difficulty is perhaps if there's a default on existing contractor obligations where the contract is cross-jurisdictional. So one party may be uh, in China, an individual or a company in China, the other party uh, is Australian. It also creates difficulties in, in terms of enforcing the contract. Sure, you can, you can maybe sue in an Australian court, uh, but the service um, of court documents, it is very stringent and um, it requires, uh, in simple terms, it requires you to first translate the pleadings into Chinese in simplified Chinese and then lodge it with uh, the registrar, send it to the Ministry of Justice in the higher people's court in China uh, in one of the five provinces. And then they, the central authority of China will then send it to a relevant court who will then serve it on the entity or the individual. So this process is going to take easily up to half a year. Right. So, much much so different to the Australian system, but we'll accept that I'm talking about length, length of time. Is it quicker or is it shorter? That, that... I'm, I'm not sure how, um, for example, if this were to commence in China, uh, the, this court proceeding, I'm not sure whether it would be the same process serving uh, the documents on an Australian entity. Um, I imagine it to be similar given that both countries are signatory to the Hague Convention Treaty for service of documents. Yeah. So, Louis, yeah, so we've... We're definitely seeing some issues about the flow of, flow of money. Um, one of the things that I just in my reading, I, I see the word uh, involution um, and, uh, and and what it means for the and they talk about you know the China what it means for the China relationship with Australia and, and, and the world. Um, Chin, you you've got some knowledge on that. Um, explain what that means. Oh, I keep I keep reading about it. Yeah. Um... I think involution, um, it was an, uh, an agriculture or an anthropology term, just means you know, like when society develops yeah. to a certain state, it cannot progress anymore. There's no room for progression, so it turns inward. And we see that as, we see that becoming an internet buzzword in China. And a lot of people use that hua to describe their lifestyle because, you know, somehow they see little progression in you know the career um, maybe relationship and or other facets of life and I guess what we see is mm, kind of reflected in the trade relations a little bit in terms of businesses um, especially in like manufacturing and factories uh, you know they're transferring the labor cost you know to to other countries because they realize if they don't do that um, there's little room for, for growth. So, so we see factories and manufacturers paying more and more attention to, you know, like branding and using new technology. So they're trying to actually upgrade the system. So that's kind of what we see 
uh, in the businesses, um, I guess, coming to us, inquiring about that. And also echoing what um, Richard and um, Catherine has mentioned previously when I was working at the bank, obviously, um, one of the biggest inquiries is how to actually um, transfer funds, um, you know, out of China. But obviously, you know, as the recipient, um, the banks can't really advise on that. But yeah, that's definitely something that we see constant um, being brought up. But it's not just to Australia. It's, it's, it's mainly on the China front. Okay. Okay. Uh, fi finally, Richard, um, I mean, how do you, the relationships um, between um, the China market and, uh, I mean, how do you, I mean, how do you develop those and maintain those? Um, I mean, currently, you yeah. know, during the, the difficult times, but also just generally, I mean, how, can you give some advice about, yeah. um, you know, how clients can do that? Okay. So actually I work in, work in this space for over, eight years in, in Australia, once I became a partner. So basically, you know, given the main, the relationship between mainland China and Australia is being a difficult, so I will actually spend more time and focus on the overseas Chinese market. So the actually the, the population of overseas Chinese is over 60 million. That's that's just two and a half times than the, the, the whole Australian uh, population. It is a very, very large market. So um, I would suggest you, um, you know, to consider it's, the low hand fruit is to develop business relationship with the Australian Chinese community, as well as the Southeastern Asia countries like, you know, Malaysia, Singapore, Vietnam, you know, Indonesia, Philippines, you know, the, the rich people there, a lot of, a number of the rich people there uh, actually have a Chinese background. So, if you are a part of the international uh, network or business network, consider to build a relationship with the China desk in other country, in other jurisdictions. So um, for example, I mean, like next year, so we established China desk in large countries, uh, such as UK, Germany, Italy, France, and the US. The good things of that is there is less culture challenge and the language barrier. You know, if you deal with mainland in China, because it's too big, you always have this culture challenge. In China, there, there could be over 20 or 30 different <laughs> subculture there, right? Yeah. But whereas deal with overseas, China desk, it will be less challenge. And also the good thing is they all have very extensive and deep relationship back into China. So, so it, it's an easy way to, to expand your network and business relationship by doing that sort of, you know, building the, a good reputation in the overseas Chinese community and your name will flow back to the mainland China. And, and, and I suppose, you know, in, in us talking recently, Richard, one of the things that for a long time is we thought that Hong Kong was the gateway into mainland China and that that is just the wrong way. It's clear from our discussions and, um, yeah between Catherine and, um, and Chin and ourselves is that that is, that is a prehistoric view and thought. Um, you you got you to hop, skip and jump Hong Kong and go straight into mainland. Do you, do you agree with that? Yes, I, I agree with that. Because I, uh, I'll say instead of Hong Kong, uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe it's not very polite. You know, Hong Kong could be a, 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 a bottleneck the, other than a, a gateway to China, put this way. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, that's that's definitely what we've we've learned. Um, now moving on, uh, we're, we're we're tight for time, but I, I thought we'd sort of finish about what we're seeing, what industries have really been impacted. I mean, there's some obvious ones, and we've touched on them today. Um, but it'd be good to hear about what people, um, what you're seeing in the various industries. Um, and I'll sort of revert to Catherine about um, the education sector. I mean, that's um, that's just one area that is, would have to have been impacted and will be impacted for a while. A bit of COVID, a bit of, um, and also um, relationship issues. What, what are you seeing, Catherine, in that space? So in terms of education, especially tertiary or higher education, I 
don't know if it's on the uh, Chinese media, but the China, so, sorry, not sure if it's in the Australian media, but the China, China's Ministry of Education actually warned the Chinese against studying in Australia just in February okay. this year. This is the second time. First time was, I think, in, in June last year. So basically, it was sort of worded as, you know, Chinese students should make a full assessment of risk and consider carefully whether to go or even return to Australia to study. So that's going to have quite a huge impact, I think, on, on the prospective you know, students who might want to consider studying abroad from China. Um, it might mean that it, unofficially, it might, might mean that it is a bit more difficult to get the papers to come to, to Australia. And if that's true, that's going to impact on the, the education, tertiary education industry and, um, I guess we are, the universities are very reliant on Chinese students. For okay. example, in, in 2019, I think Chinese international students account, to, account for close to half of the total population of international students in Australia. So, wow. so that's wow. definitely going to be a huge impact if that were to continue. Um, and I guess also the same for property development. Uh, many Chinese, well, a good portion of Chinese students, their parents might buy an apartment for them to live in uh, when they're studying here. So that's going to have an impact. And also, of course, the hospitality industry. So we're seeing that, uh, for example, in the Melbourne CBD or in, in Glen Waverley or close to universities, there's more of a, a nightlife in the sense that many restaurants are open till late night. And really, they rely on the support or the business of the international students who um, enjoy or who is familiar with that kind of lifestyle uh, to hang out later at night, have uh, you know late supper and stuff like that. Um, all those especially I think cafes and restaurants in Melbourne CBD that open or cater specifically towards international students, you will see a huge impact yep. in the short term at least. Well, we're, we're, we're seeing that in the time to determine if it's COVID and, and I suppose initially it's COVID, but also, you know, full um, relationship because yeah, we're right near the Victoria market um, and there's a lot of accommodation here and there's historically lots of uh, restaurants that are open late, yeah, and, and we're, you know, definitely can see that they're not open and um, just because they just don't have the clientele. So, yeah. Richard, what, what are you seeing? Are you seeing any particular industries that are being uh, impacted during this um, this relationship issues? Yeah, I think apart from the, uh, the industry being discussed, actually I'm more concerned about the, uh, the, the business investment immigration. You know, because the uh, especially the business and investment immigrants that brings the money, business opportunities, uh, and between the two countries and being a bridge and linkage for business, right? Whether it's M and A, IPOs, or these large acquisitions. So uh, I'm more um, concerned about this industry being impacted because of the uh, the uncertainty between the two countries now. Yeah. So. Yep. And what, what about uh, Catherine Tourism? It is, it's, it's hard um, to tell because of the international borders. Um, and it's I think it's hard to predict. As long as they can get a visa, it's hard to predict. Um, just because, you know, it might be difficult to send your students here doesn't mean you won't necessarily travel, especially in, in terms of distance, I guess, if you want to go to a somewhat a Western country from a Chinese perspective. Australia is still closer. It's a it's a good destination um, still heaps of Chinese food if if you know they come they arrive and they feel like some something closer to home so I think um, haven't seen a lot of news or heard a lot about this we're not thinking about traveling at the moment no no we're not we, yeah we, we, we wish it'll be, interesting. it'll be interesting what happens when the borders open um, hopefully the relationship is has been you know fixed by that stage um, I mean, it's difficult to get that flow in and out anyway, but, um, you know, it's, it's really hard to sort of gauge exactly you know, how much tourism has been impacted by that. I mean, cotton, you had mentioned the other day that the cotton industry um, trades, you know, it's a big trade partner is China. Um, you said that you, would, you felt that would be impacted. Uh, have you seen that in, in your... Um, not not specifically, yeah. Yep, yep. Very good. 
Well, I mean, we're close to the end. I, I'm, I'm really interested to talk about the future and, and what you see, um, what Australia can do to mend a relationship. I mean, one of the things I said earlier is, is about uh, the trade. Um, in January and February this year, we had record um, growth. We had our exports rose by 8%. Um, to a record high of 26 billion um, with iron ore, of course, a major contributor of that. Um, but Japan, as an example, has had um, historically had, and in recent recent time, had uh, similar issues, um, relationships issues with China. And, and they're, I think, one of the highlights of a country that has amended their relationship with, uh, with China and uh, has flourished. So, I'm interested um, from everyone about the future and basically can the relationship be repaired? Um, Chen, I'll go to you first. What do you think? Can the relationship be repaired? Um, you know, that's definitely what we hope for. Um, but as I said, I think it largely depends on how the US-China relationship unfolds. And um, I guess, you know, when Japan and China had the dispute, I guess, that was at a different time. And China's definitely, definitely at a different time now. You know, the administration and the diplomatic um, attitude is, is different. So I guess, you know, I would say it, 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 it sort of goes back to that bigger context. Yep. Richard, what do you think? Do you, do you think it's, are, are we still gonna have that trip to Shanghai? Um, or will Australians be barred to come in? Uh, is the relationship going to be repaired? Or, I mean, you would think it will over time, but is yeah. it a long time? Okay, I, I actually, you know, you never, uh, a lot of people never know that actually Shanghai has, you know, during Christmas time, the Shanghai has more tallest, you know, the Christmas tree, uh, you know, over compared to the rest of the world, you know. Is that right? You can see how, <laughs> how Western Shanghai is. Um, <laughs> So I will say relationship will be repaired. I, I'm very optimistic on that. But Australia actually is a, is a, is can play a very important balancing role in the Asia Pacific region and achieve a very good economic benefits. But it really depends on how smart we are. So if if I want to use one word, is flexibility is very important, you know, in this region. Yeah, it's sometimes not black and white, <laughs> you know. You know what I mean? It, it needs a bit of uh, yeah, uh, strategies and flexibility. Yes. Yeah, Catherine, um, is it too late? Will, will it take years? What's I, your feeling? <laughs> I, I think I'm going to be optimistic and, and say there's a Chinese saying that there is no forever friends and there will not be forever enemies. So there's n nothing is black or white, just like what Richard said. Yeah, but I'm hopeful. Hopeful. Mm. Fantastic. Well, look, we've come to the end. Um, we're running out of time. I'm conscious that everyone um, can have their lunch hour and, and, and watch us. Um, we, we've got a number of questions. Uh, we just run out of time. Um, some really very detailed questions in there I, I see already. I apologize. We haven't got, got to them. Um, but we will address them um, directly. So thank you for your questions. We always, always appreciate those. Um, so we will get, get to that. Um, firstly, from all at Rogers Reedy, um, Chin, thank you very much for attending uh, and presenting. Richard, thank you. Catherine, once again, thank you very much. Um, thank you. It's been thank you so much, a fan, fantastic insight. Um, winding down, um, we have another one of these webinars next next month um, and hopefully we'll get our IT issues sorted out before then but um, uh, we, look, we, we had 250 people um, attend uh, today's uh, presentation fantastic numbers absolutely fantastic one of our highest um, numbers um, so there's a lot of interest next month we're talking about how we're finding uh, COVID has impacted businesses uh, in the country areas um, and we've got some great um, speakers from around Australia who um, specialise in those areas and how uh, the rural area has been impacted by COVID. Um, and uh, 
And so that is going to be our next presentation next month. Thank you once again. Um, if you have any insolvency um, distressed um, clients that you would um, like to contact us about, um, come to your local Rogers Ready office. We're all around Australia. That's what I was trying to say before. We're in every state and territory. Um, so if you have any questions about uh, um, distressed clients that uh, you need advice, um, please feel free to uh, contact us. Thank you for your time today. All the best and be safe. Okay, thank you. Thank Thanks, you, guys. everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.